Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Yvonne Vasquez, and I'm a graduate student at the University of California, Santa Cruz, in Dr. Elena Vasquez's lab. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about how, um, in my lab, we use RNA information to identify druggable targets in kids with cancer. Um, and as we've heard from speakers so far, there's many different avenues to study cancer, so you might be wondering why we've chosen to focus on RNA for pediatric cancers. Um, well, although cancer is regarded as a genetic disease caused by the accumulation of mutations over time, this explains how adult cancers arise, but not quite uh, pediatric cancers, which have a lower mutational burden. Um, in this figure, you can see um, the number of mutations in coding genes for different pediatric cancers on the left and different adult cancers on the right. And um, you can see that on average, the number of mutations in pediatric cancers is lower compared to adults. Pediatric cancers are instead regarded as epigenetic diseases, where um, we see, often see defects in epigenetic machinery and also global reprogramming of gene expression. And it's clear that for pediatric cancers, we need to look beyond mutations. And the Vasky Lab believes that looking at RNA instead, we may be able to identify transcriptional programs that are driving a patient's tumor um, and can possibly be targeted for treatment. So my lab um, uses a method that we published called comparative analysis of RNA expression, also known as CARE. This is an N of 1 analysis where we compare an RNA sequencing profile of a single patient um, to an entire compendia that we have curated with over 12,000 tumor RNA-seq profiles from both adult and pediatric patients. Um, this analysis yields two deliverables, um, one of which is it identifies molecularly similar samples using spearman rank correlations, and then two, it's able to identify abnormally expressed genes in the patient's tumor compared to a comparative cohort of your choosing. So for identifying outliers, we start with an RNA sequencing profile from a single patient, um, as represented by the hexagon in the center, and then we compare that profile against a cohort composing of the entire tumor compendia on the left, which consists of all cancers. Um, sorry. But we um, also compare um, against a cohort of similar tumors, as you can see on the right. And this cohort includes samples from the compendia that we believe to be histologically similar, meaning they are labeled with the same disease as your patient, but also samples that we define to be transcriptionally similar. And so it's using this method of care that we decided to assess the feasibility and utility of incorporating RNA expression into the clinic. And so with Dr. Sherry Spunt, as well as other pediatric oncologists at Stanford, um, we partnered together to launch the CARE Impact Study. This was a study where we recruited 33 patients with difficult to treat solid pediatric tumors, most of which had already exhausted standard of care treatments. And for each patient, we looked at DNA mutation data as well as RNA sequencing data, and we identified mutations, fusions, and highly expressed genes for each patient, and then filtered that list for um, for what we called clinically actionable targets or um, things that could be targeted with an FDA-approved therapy or the patient could be enrolled on a clinical trial. And then we suggested potential therapies for each patient to Stanford clinicians who ultimately carried out clinical decisions. And so now I want to summarize some of the findings. Um, so 28 of the patients underwent both DNA mutation um, testing as well as RNA sequencing testing. And so of these patients, we found that the majority, 93%, had targets identified from RNA sequencing data. This included 12 patients that had targets identified only from RNA, and then 14 that had targets identified from both RNA and DNA. Um, but then when we look at DNA testing, only 54% of the patients had targets um, identified, one patient from DNA testing alone, and then again, 14 from both DNA and RNA. And so overall, analyzing RNA identifies additional actionable targets not evident from um, DNA analysis alone. Um, and now I want to describe one patient from the study where we were able to identify an effective therapy uh, from the RNA sequencing data, but not from the DNA mutation data. So we had a 28-month-old boy who was diagnosed with myelopathelia carcinoma of the liver. This was non-metastatic. And so this cancer is ultra-rare, and there were no actionable mutations from tumor DNA profiling. And so this patient was treated with uh, chemotherapy and the liver tumor was excised. However, the patient eventually developed metastatic disease to the lungs and therapy options were needed. So he was enrolled on our study. So shown here is the first deliverable from care analysis where we identify similar tumors. So after comparing the tumor's RNA sequencing profile to the entire compendia on the left, 
we were able to identify a cohort of 339 similar tumors. Again, this cohort includes tumors that are histologically similar as well as transcriptionally similar. So in terms of histological similarity, we had three other myopathelia carcinomas um, in our compendia, but this isn't enough to detect outliers. So this is why we also look at samples that are um, transcriptionally similar. So when we look at transcriptional similarity, we were, um, sorry, I don't know why it did that. When we look at transcriptional similarity, um, we were able to identify uh, an additional 339 tumors, uh, shown in red on the right, of diverse cancer types um, that showed significant enrichment in sarcomas compared to the rest of the compendia. And this really showed how with care you're able to identify similar tumors even though sometimes that might not line up with histological similarity. So shown here is the second deliverable from care analysis where we identify overexpression outliers. And so the overexpression outliers we identified are in purple. So these were genes that were more highly expressed in our patient compared to other tumors. But in addition to um, calling outliers, we also look at pathway enrichment. So here you can also see pathways that we believe to be implicated and enriched in the patient's tumor. And in orange here, you can see of those overexpression outliers, which could be uh, targeted with an FDA approved drug. So the receptor tyrosine kinases, um, FGFR1, FGFR2, and PDGFRA could be targeted with pazopinib, and then CCND2 could be targeted with ribocyclib. So the clinician at this point decided to treat with pazopinib because of its efficacy in soft tissue sarcomas, but also its safety in children. Um, but unfortunately, the patient's lung metastases progressed, and at this point, um, the clinician and family decided to try our second finding, which was ribocyclib. And so uh, the patient was treated with 12 cycles of ribocyclib, and um, throughout the treatment, it was shown that the lung nodules remained stable. So then at that point, the lung nodules were surgically removed, and then the patient was given an additional 12 cycles of ribocyclib as maintenance treatment. Um, and after that point, um, the patient showed no evidence of disease anymore on CT scans, and the patient is now nine years old with no... Um, no apparent long-term toxicity from ribocyclib treatment. And so, although this is a success story of incorporating RNA into the clinic, we do need to address barriers that prevent this from being routinely incorporated. So as a field, we face some of the following challenges, one of which is gene expression measurements are relative, so meaning that you being able to determine if expression is high or low will depend on what you compare to. And so right now, it's kind of complicated. How do you know what cohort to use to, as a comparison? Also, um, there's a lack of standard measurements to assess the quality of an RNA sequencing run. And finally, um, it's unclear what um, abnormal expression is clinically relevant. So how do you know you have a good therapeutic target? Or if you have multiple targets, how do you know which one to prioritize? So to address the limitation of methods to assess the quality of RNA sequencing data, my lab uses a method where we count MEND reads. So MEND stands for reads that are mapped, exonic, and non-duplicate. So from our total pool of RNA sequencing reads um, at the top, we filter for reads that, one, align to the human genome, two, align to an exon, since we are focused um, on transcripts that will encode for proteins that can later be targeted. And then finally, uh, we filter for reads that represent um, unique molecules or non-technical duplicates. And so the deliverable of filtering for MEND reads is that you now have a subpopulation of your total reads that we believe reflect the integrity and quantity of RNA in your tumor and indicate whether your data can be used for robust gene expression quantification. Next, I want to address the challenge of determining the best comparative cohort uh, to use to determine high or low expression um, of genes in a patient's tumor. So we saw with the myopathelic carcinoma patient that CCND2 was an important overexpression outlier to identify. And since there's no standards for what comparative cohorts to use, we decided to see if choice of reference cohort might impact your ability to detect CCN2 overexpression. So we repeated our patient's care analysis using three additional uh, comparison cohorts, as you can see bolded there. So from our original tumor compendia of all cancers shown on the left, we filtered for, to get the following cohorts. Um, a cohort of TCGA samples, since this is publicly available data and often used in studies. Um, and then a cohort of pediatric young adult cases from patients younger than 30 years of age. And then finally, a cohort of um, Stanford samples, which would represent a single institution cohort. So here's what we found. So this plot shows for each of the four cohorts indicated on the right, the distribution of CCND2 expression um, levels for all samples in the cohort. And in red is the um, CCND2 expression for the myopathy carcinoma patient. And then in yellow is the outlier range for CCND2 overexpression. 
um, and any samples that have expression in the yellow range um, are considered to have high CCND2 expression compared to the rest of the samples in the cohort. And what you can see here is that CCND2 outlier threshold is impacted by what comparative cohort you use. And um, it's only when we use our similar tumor cohort that we identified CCND2 as an outlier. And given what we know about the patient's uh, disease control with ribocyclib, it seems that the selection of the similar tumors uh, cohort is quite important. Um, and now, to kind of to summarize everything I've shown you, um, I didn't touch on this yet, but sharing genomic data sets can have a clinical impact. We do not have a medical center at Santa Cruz, so we really rely on building our compendia by gathering lots of public RNA sequencing data sets, and um, it's really important for our work. And then also comparative analysis of RNA expression is feasible across multiple institutions. Again, we don't have a medical center, so we partner with a lot of clinicians in different hospitals. And also CARE was able to um, lead to precision medicine interventions, and also choice of comparative cohort does matter and can impact your results. Um, and with that, I just want to acknowledge all of the people who um, allowed this study to be possible, especially Dr. Vasky and Dr. Spunt, who led the efforts, and as well as the um, patients and families who participated. Uh, thank you.